When we talk to product teams and we ask them, how do they measure the impact of the products they build? We get a wide range of answers. Some will say they don't, they just go purely on vibes while others will say they do user testing or they look at metrics before and after. In this video, we're gonna look at some of the answers to these questions and make the case as to why you should be A-B testing as part of your product development process. Product teams prioritize, build, and ship new features every day. And each of these teams brings their years of experience and expertise to build the best possible product. So what do you think the success rate is in these products? Like how often are they successful in improving the metrics with which they're intended to do? Is it 80%? 50%? The actual number may surprise you. The real number industry-wide is only about one-third of the time. Let that sink in. Only one-third of the time is a feature that is released successful in moving the intended metric. That means that two-thirds of the time, the feature and changes that you launch have no effect or are actually hurting your business. And what's really wild to think about with this number is that no one is launching a product they think won't win. This is even with our best effort and all our experience and expertise in building and shipping products, we're still only successful one third of the time. And it actually gets worse than that. The more optimized your product is, that number will actually go lower as it becomes harder to find a win from an already optimized product. Here are some success rates from some other big companies. So the takeaway here is that without measuring the impact of what you're shipping, you're guessing. And really the best way to measure the impact of what you're shipping is with A-B testing. So A-B testing is a controlled way of measuring the impact of changes on real users. And you can A-B test anywhere you can run code. It could be on the client side if you have a website, it could be on the back end of some server, it could be mobile apps, it could be AI or ML models as well. So let's take a look at the basics of an A-B test. So first you come up with a hypothesis, some idea about what you want to test on your product. You then choose the audience you want to assign this to, and this could be your entire audience or it could be a subset of that audience. You then randomly assign it into two or more groups. One of the group gets the original product as you had it, and the other group gets the new treatment version or any variations of that treatment. You then track how they behave within your product, and then you use statistics to figure out what effect that has and if that effect is statistically significant or not. Some product teams will tell us they don't need to run A-B tests as they've already done user testing, or they're gonna look at the metrics before and after the launch. Let's take a look at why these aren't great ways to measure the impact of features. User testing is part of the user research process and typically involves showing a mock-up of your product to a small set of users and watching them as they try to complete a task and asking them questions. It can be very useful in finding user experience bugs, but there are some downsides when using it to validate the success of new features. One of the biggest problems with user testing is that the sample sizes are really low, typically about three to 10 users. And while they can give you some initial indications of if this project might be useful or not, or potential bugs in those user experiences, making causal decisions about the success or failure of a project based on 10 users is not a good idea. So if you have the traffic, you should really test it on live users. So let's take a look at why before and after testing isn't always great either. For example, let's take that user registration flow. Let's say we launched a new design here, and this is our conversion rate for a new user registration over time. And after you launch it, the conversion rate looks like this. Is this a success or failure? The answer is we don't know, because we don't know what would have happened if we had not launched this feature. There's so much noise in the signal caused by things like holidays or just changes in user traffic or maybe a new ad campaign that it's really hard to isolate your change from all the other changes that are happening to your product or just to your audience in general. Here's an example from Airbnb where they initially launched a feature, ran it for a while, and then ended up rolling back the test because as a controlled experiment, it actually lost. It did not improve performance. But if you just looked at overall performance, you would never be able to tell it was unsuccessful because of the day-to-day -day variations and just the general noise. And plus, Airbnb at the time, traffic was just growing. So it's hard to tell if this would have been even higher if they had not launched it. It can be hard to determine causal relationship between product changes and metrics without a control variation. So this is why we use A-B testing, because it controls for all the externalities and gives us causal inference in terms of what impact our changes had to our product. Another advantage of using A-B testing is that it lets you rapidly iterate on a product. Let's say you just launched a new product and let's graph out on the x-axis all possible designs and then the y-axis will have all the possible conversion rates of that new design. What are the odds that this first version is the optimal conversion rate? Pretty close to zero, right? 
With A-B testing, you can rapidly test changes to a product and incrementally optimize a feature. Let's talk about how A-B testing, or experimentation, fits into the product development process. Product managers spend a lot of time on process and have systems like Agile and Scrum and Kanban or whatever the hell this is. And in each of these systems, they have a different definition for done. Sometimes done just means shipped. Sometimes done is defined as accepted the user stories. And sometimes it's the product stakeholders have signed off. In fact, in the hundreds of systems I've looked at, I've yet to see one that defines success in terms of the impact it has on your business. But the good news is whatever the product development system you use, you can redefine what done means to add experimentation. So before you start building a new feature or product, you should define what success looks like ahead of time. So each project, you should define the hypothesis, like what are you trying to do with this project? And then what actions and behaviors would your users do with this project that would signal its success? And how would you measure that? What metrics would signal that success? And then finally, what is the smallest thing we can build to determine if this hypothesis is correct or incorrect? So for example, let's say you're building a new login page. Your hypothesis might be that by simplifying the number of fields the user has to enter, we'll increase our user registration rate. So the most likely metrics you would want to measure for that project would be the signup rate. And so for the smallest thing you can build for that project, you might realize that you may be able to test this with the existing design and just remove some fields. And that way you can validate this hypothesis is correct without actually having to build an entirely new experience. Finally, with all this in hand, you should figure out if you have the traffic to run this experiment. Now with the one third success rate of the features that we ship actually being successful is a rather sobering number. When you adopt experimentation as part of your product development process, you can actually shift that around to be about two thirds with reframing the question in terms of how often do we make the right shipping decision? So for instance, not shipping a feature that would hurt your metrics should be counted as a win. When experiment success rates are low and you need to run a lot of experiments to incrementally optimize features, it's important that your A-B testing platform bring the cost per experiment close to zero as possible. This is one of the goals of GrowthBook to really be the in-house A-B testing platform that you don't have to build. So in conclusion, if you're not A-B testing, you're guessing, and you should adopt A-B testing as part of your product development process if you have the traffic to do so. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.